Don't forget to mark Teen Camp down on your calendar, July 13th, the big week of Teen Camp. It's going to be packed, jammed full. So uh, the big week of Teen Camp will be July the 13th during that week. Psalm 102, verse number 25. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, and as a vesture thou shalt change them and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Two things you'll notice in verse 26, and I want to mention them this morning. You'll notice that everything down here, earth, atmosphere, everything, changes. But God never changes. I'd like to preach to you. Would you listen to me serious for just a few minutes this morning? This is... uh, an important message on the title, Change. This change is a word that we don't feel comfortable with. We don't like change. We ask why. We, we as human beings, like for things to stay like they are. None of us have enjoyed the change that our church has had to endure in the past two to three months. We just as well face it this morning, change is a part of life. It can make us bitter. It can make us better. I want to say some things about change this morning. When when somebody dies in your family, it's hard to believe when you go back home that they're not going to be there no more. And it's real hard. Some people have a tremendous time accepting change. I've heard it all my life. I've heard it since I've been preaching. Preacher, why can't things just be like they used to be? And the reason for that is, is because in this world, in this world of sin, things change. Our church is going through a change. We don't like it. I don't like it. I like for all the days to be glory. I like for all the services to be shouting. I like for all the souls to be one. The families to get along. The truth is, this morning, everything in this world must go through change. In the early 1900s, somebody said, everything in life that we really accept undergoes change. So suffering must become love. I'm going to give you some quotes. If we try to resist change, or we try to refuse to accept it, or hold on to the blessings and joy belonging to the past, we will postpone all the new blessings awaiting us on a higher level and find ourselves on a a weakened, barren, bleak winter of sorrow and loneliness. And all that simply means is that people who will not let go of the past will be miserable the rest of their lives. In this life, we will encounter hurts and trials that we will not be able to change. We are just going to have to allow them to change us. Change is painful, but change is needful. The price of progress is change. James Dobson, although you may not agree with a lot of his philosophy, made a great statement. He said, if you are going through difficult times today, hold steady. It will change soon. If you're experiencing smooth sailing today and easy times now, brace yourself. It will change soon. The only thing you can be certain of is that it'll change. This morning, I'd like to preach to you a little bit about change. I'm sad about bad change. 
But it's always been this way. I remember reading in the Bible, uh, the first man and woman that God put on this earth was Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve lived in an absolutely perfect environment. Adam and Eve had no problems. And you know, we don't know how long Adam and Eve got to live like that. It might have been a long time God left them there to live perfect. They could eat anything they wanted. They had no worries about sickness or failure. They had no worries about problems. They were in an absolutely perfect environment. And then one day, the devil tempted Eve, and she took her the fruit, and sin uh, came into her heart and life, of course. And Adam, her husband, took her the fruit, and he did eat. Immediately, there was change. That change has affected the entire rest of human history. You and I sit here this morning in sin-cursed bodies because of that change that was made. We don't like that. I wish it hadn't happened. But we're, we have no choice but to live with it and through it. We have no choice. I got to think about this the other day, and I heard a man mention on tape. Do you realize that Adam and Eve, you know how long Adam lived after they were expelled from the Garden of Eden? Adam lived eight hundred years. Eight hundred years missing what he used to have in the Garden of Eden. Do you think it ever come up? Do you think it was ever discussed around the table? When that first day came out there and that first week of meals and they had uh, uh, Adam come in one day and he had to wipe the sweat off of his face, he said, Eve, why did you have to do that? I would have never even knew what this stuff was if you hadn't ate of that fruit. Right? Isn't that right? You never had to sweat or work for a living. The reason we have to work for a living is because of that change that took place that day. He said, I sure wish you hadn't have done that. But it wasn't long after that until Eve announced she was going to have a baby. And when that baby came and those pains, them birth pains started coming, she looked at Adam and said, Adam, why did you have to eat that fruit? He said, you eat it first. Can't blame it all on me. She said, yes, yes, but I was deceived. The devil tricked me. You had your eyes open. You knew what she was doing. Don't you know that came up? The change they had to live with. Can you imagine Cain and Abel growing up and Adam and Eve talking to them when they were little boys, telling them stories at night about that great home they used to live in. Did you know that mom and daddy used to live in a house and we had no problems and we could eat anything we want? You mean we could have all the candy? Yes. You mean we'd have all the ice cream? Yes. You mean we never had no sick? You mean snakes wouldn't hurt you? No. You mean spiders wouldn't? No. You mean, well, what happened? And Adam would say, well, son, mama just eat us out of house and home. I'm tired of talking about it. And then she'd say, well, now don't go blaming me and their children and their children and their children. But you know, I feel like that after a time, after maybe 30 years went by, that thing probably come up maybe, maybe, maybe once every two or three years. And then maybe after a hundred years, it come up maybe another. I heard people say, you know, I, I just wish things could be like they used to be. Well, so do I. I wish we could all be back in the Garden of Eden with no sin and no thing. But change is a part of life that we must accept. We will accept. Because you can't live in the past forever. Every time they gave birth, they thought of their sin. Every time they explained to their grandkids why they got sick, they had to explain about sin. Why'd you let the devil talk you into this? I don't know, but there's one thing about it. We can't go back. We ate the fruit. We did the wrong. We must raise our children right and teach them to honor God and serve God. And by the way, I want to remind you that Adam and Eve did serve God after they got cast out of the Garden of Eden. They didn't get mad at God and say, it's not fair, God. You have no business kicking us out of here. Yeah, it's not right. God made clothes of skin. God did forgive them. God made them pure again. God provided a remedy for them. God washed away their sin. God took it away. But they lived with that change the entire rest of their life. 800 years. I'll tell you something. I read the story of Abraham. Abraham in the Bible was a man that... 
God took him out one night and he said, Abraham, and there's a big clear night and there's a million stars in the sky. And God said, Abraham, do you see them in stars in the sky? Let's see if you can count them. And he went, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And, and then he kind of, kind of lost where he was and, and tried. He said, Lord, I can't, I can't even get past a hundred or two. He said, Abraham, I'm going to give you as many kids as they are stars in that sky. And Abraham said, Lord, you tell me. He said, I ain't going to lie to you. You're going to have them. Well, he's 86 years old. At 86 years old, it still hadn't happened. Abraham got ahead of God. Abraham, one of the greatest men in the Bible. Would you agree with that? Say amen. amen. There's probably not, there's very few men that would be recognized greater in the Bible than Abraham, the man of God. Abraham got ahead of God. He talked to Sarah, his wife. He said, now listen, uh, he said, God told me he was going to have a kid. Something ain't right here. He said, uh, we're going to have to, he, he got ahead of God. You never want to get ahead of God. You never want to get behind God. You always want to walk with God. Well, we get in trouble when we walk ahead of God or get behind God. Abraham got ahead of God. You know, he took Hagar, the handmaid. You know what he did with Hagar? He took Hagar, his, his, his wife's handmaid. He had a baby by Hagar. He said, God told me I was going to have a baby. This must be the way God's going to fulfill His promise. So Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. And God said about Ishmael when he was born, God said, God said, he will be a wild man. He said, every man's hand will be against him. And he said, his hand will be against every man. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, Ishmael, if you know Bible history and you know the Old Testament, became the father of all those crazy people that we now refer to as terrorists. Uh, Iranians, Iraq, uh, uh, those people like that, Saddam Hussein, and people like that. And Abraham got out of God's will. Things changed forever in Abraham's life. Abraham's life was never the same after that. He still believed God. He still was counted to him for righteousness. He still was God's man on this earth. He still fulfilled his promise that he made through Isaac. But God's curse on this world came on Ishmael because if Ishmael hadn't been born, there wouldn't be no error. And if there wasn't no Arabs, they wouldn't have all the oil. And gas wouldn't be so high in Marion right now. And me and you would have a lot happier life. Amen? Amen. Well, I hate that change. Change is bad sometimes. But let me tell you the rest of Abraham's story. At 99, God said, okay, now, you jump the gun. Now, I'm ready to do it. You ready to do it my way now? Abraham said, yes, sir. Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah, <laughs> she was 90. She was 90 years old. She laughed in the tent. God said she's going to have a baby. Sure enough, 100 years, Isaac was born. God said, sell them stars, Abraham. That's how many kids I'm going to give you. Guess what happened then? Things went along pretty good. That boy became a teenager. That boy became a teenager. God said, Abraham, listen to this. Here's what we don't like. This is what we don't like. I don't like it. You don't like it. This is, what, this is what's wrong with some of us right now. We don't like things to change. He's the only boy that finally come. And God woke him up one morning and said, take him to the mountain where I'm telling you to and sacrifice him as a sacrifice to me. He took that little boy since he's that high and said, here he is, the promised child. Here he is. Ishmael's a wild man. He's crazy. But here's, here's my boy, baby boy. He's going to be the father of many nations. And God told him, take him out and kill him. And Abraham went up there and Abraham went to the bottom of that mountain. And before they went up on that mountain, he said, son, let's stop and let's have a little prayer meeting. And he got down and he said, God, you're the God of my fathers. God, you're the God that's brought me through all these things. God, I don't understand this. 
God, this is. God, you promised me He was going to be my boy. God, you promised me He was going to be the like the stars of the sky. God, this can't be your will. There ain't no way this can be your will. But if you say do it, I'm going to do it. You say Abraham wouldn't have done it. I'll guarantee you, brother, he had his knife sharpened. He had his blade ready. He was ready to take that boy's life, even though it seemed against every promise. But God ever made him. He was ready to take that boy's life. You talk about a change. He was getting ready to go through a change. He didn't like it. I don't blame him. About that time before his knife come down in that boy's chest. And right about the time he thought, well, maybe I missed God. Maybe it wasn't God that told me that. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like God told you something and then later found out, well, I don't know if God told me that or not, and then you begin to wonder, I don't know what God said. Have you ever been that way? Abraham had that knife over that little boy, and he's ready to come down, and right when he did, God's hand stopped and said, hold it right there, son. I'm going to stop you right there, right over there. He said, I will provide myself a sacrifice. He had the ram caught in the thicket. Abraham went back home with his boy. I'm saying, listen, change scares us. Change bothers us. Change is not easy to live with, especially in this generation. It's hard. We want everything. You know why some people change churches and change jobs and change homes so much? Because they can't accept change. Sooner or later, you've got to change you. We have to change. You'll never go nowhere where you're going to get away from change. Change is throughout history. Job didn't cry and complain when all his kids got killed. I mean, I'm sure he shed some tears over missing his boys and girls. One guy comes walking in and said, Fire fell on his sheep and the servants and burned them all up. And I'm the only one left to tell you. He hadn't got through talking to another fellow come running in and said, The Chaldeans come in, killed all your camels and sheep and servants and carried them away. And I'm the only one left to tell you about Job. Somebody else come running in and he said, Job, I hate to tell you this, but he said, all your sons and daughters were at one of them's house and they was having a party and having a little get-together. And he said, uh, uh, the, uh, the big storm came and, and the house burned and the, or fell and it's all dead. And all your boys and all your girls is dead. And you know what Job did? Job said this, uh, you talk about a change. You talk about a change. He went from all those camels, all those sheep, all those herds, all those servants, ten children, to absolutely nothing in one day day's time. And brother, you know what Job did? Job said, I don't understand why this has happened to me. Job said, I don't know. Well, I don't know why. They... But he said, there's one thing I do know. He said, naked. I came out of my mother's womb. He said, naked. I'll go back to him. He said, the Lord giveth. He said, the Lord taketh away. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. And I want to say this morning, we may not always understand change. We may not always be willing to accept change. We may not always be able to handle change. But the Lord knew before, 21 years ago, the change we go through. And I want to say this morning, and naked I came out of my mother's womb. Naked I shall return. Lord God, the Lord take it away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord makes no mistakes. The Lord makes no mistakes. Boy, I'd hate to talk all this message this morning and tell you about these changes that took place in the Bible without telling you some good ones. Can I take just a minute before I get through? That one preacher we've been having up here preaches too long, so I'm going to be shorter than him. Let me tell you about some things that never change. You say, well, Brother Danny, according to you, we don't know from one day to the next what's going to happen. You're absolutely right. Here's some good news. Turn to Malachi chapter 3. Let me show you something in your Bible. Malachi chapter 3. Boy, this is good. Malachi chapter 3. Now, you can hold on to this. You can hold on to this. You may go to your job and get fired in the morning. One of your kids may be in an accident and be killed by one of mine. Me, you, we don't know what's going to happen. Things change as we go through life. We don't like it. We don't like it. 
But let me show you some things that will never change. Malachi chapter number 3 and verse 6. For I am the Lord. I change not. Glory, hallelujah. He knew this before He laid the foundation of the world. He knew this before Jesus ever went to Calvary. God said, I never change. You know what? I know why you people are here this morning. You're not here because of me. You know I ain't nothing. I'm a less than nothing man I've ever been. Sorrier than the sorriest. But I know why you're here this morning. Because you know I believe in and you believe in a God that never changes. Glory be to His precious name. He never changes. People change. Houses change. Homes change. Your yard changes. Your car rots. Uh, you get old. I get old. We all, everything changes. But He never changes. And let me say, He's hands our church. God started this church. God started this church. God begins this church. And you know what my policy has been all along, every, ever, ever since it started, not just since this happened, uh, not since I lay our storm that we're in, but ever since the very beginning, my, hand, my policy is hands off. It's God's church. He began it. He's well able to take care of it. He's well able to fix it. He's well able to do what He wants to do. He's God. He changes not. He, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, He's the same today. He's the same forever. Let me show you another thing that don't change. I can talk all day about that, but let me tell you something else that don't change. Is your Bible don't change. Bible don't change. Some people do. Ours don't. It's forever settled in heaven. You know, I've always appreciated... Uh, every time I get in an airplane and I... The more I fly on an airplane, the less I like it. And every time I get on one, I look and I look, if it's a little one especially, you see instrument panels. And on these instrument panels, there's, uh, it shows you, there's millions of little screws and knobs and little levers and stuff like that. It shows you altitude, speed, wind below, I don't know what all them things. Uh, uh, Gene, uh, Gene Paget knows, I guarantee you that. Now, he might know what all that stuff is, don't you, brother Gene? You know what all them things mean? You better, I, don't tell me now, man, I've done been up there with you. But anyway, anyway, uh, them things fly. You know what I appreciate, and I know he does too, you appreciate them instruments. But you know what? I like to get in there on a clear, sunshiny day. And on a clear, sunshiny day where you can see for miles and miles and miles. And you can just see. And I've even looked up like this and could see the runway when we're starting to go down and hit that runway. And boy, I'll tell you what, it's a blessing to be able to just see. There it is, pilot, hit it right there. But you know, on those cloudy days, those, those days so cloudy that when you take off in a plane, in less than five seconds, you can't see nothing. Five seconds. It's just like... And then you can't see nothing. And that's when you begin to appreciate those instruments. And you thank God for them instruments. When you can't see, it's just all you've got to depend on is them instruments that tell you what to do. And you go by them gauges. That gauge said, you're this high. Go a little bit to the left. Go, you're this way. You're leaning this way. South, north, whatever they do. Hey, so them gauges, they go like it. Buddy, I appreciate them gauges on them cloudy days. What a blessing. What a blessing to have them gauges. Man, you ought to hit one head off if it wasn't for them gauges. Them gauges drag you through the night. Them gauges drive you through the cloudy storm. Them gauges go there. And I'll tell you what. You know what I'm talking about, buddy. You know what I'm talking about. Listen, I've always believed the Bible. I've believed the Bible ever since I've been saved. I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God from front to back. I don't believe it's got a mistake in it. I believe it's a perfect gauge that will guide you through any crisis in life. I don't believe there's one thing wrong with this book. And I want to tell you what this morning, ladies and gentlemen, I've always believed it. I've always believed it. But many of those days were clear. Many of those days I could see for myself. Many of those days I could see a long way. Well, Greg, I could see it, and it didn't mean that much. I want to tell you what. You hear me this morning. I tell you what. In the last few days, in the last few months, there's been night after night after night when I couldn't see nothing but black darkness, and I didn't know what was going to happen, and I didn't know where I was going to live or die. And brother, them gauges, I'm 
get down, begin to read it. And I said, go on, God. It's the gate. It's the gate. That'll get you from here. Some gauges will get you from here. Never have I appreciated the book. That never changes. Like I appreciate now. I'm telling you, there's Psalm 40 and Psalm 37 and Psalm 41 and Psalm 90 that I've read so many times. I about I quote them in my sleep. And I'm saying, Oh God, be merciful to me. Oh God, be merciful to me. Listen, you'll never appreciate the gauges till you can't see, and that's all you got to go by. Hey, when you ain't, when you don't even have a friend, I couldn't tell y'all. Man, I, I'm about, oh, I'm about to just, I'm just about to just have a shot spell this morning just thinking about his goodness. You say, Brother Danny, don't you know there's a lot of people hate you? Yeah, they always have. And there's a lot more now. But that's not even what I'm talking about. That ain't even got nothing to do with it. I'm thinking about something, brother, that the devil didn't give me. And the devil can't take away. And it's God's book. I got it in my heart. It never changes. It's God's book. It's God's book. It never changes. Hey, turn us on here. And he's got the answer for your problem this morning. Some of you sitting here this morning, you think... There's no way out of the mess I'm in. God's Word never changes. It'll help you fly through. I don't like it like that. I like to be able to see, don't you? We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what the future of our church holds. I don't know what my future holds. But oh, I'm so thankful. But the Bible never changes. I've seen people get mad and go to church and use the NIV, brother, and see where it calls Jesus, or calls Him Lucifer, over there in the book of Isaiah, or Ezekiel. Isaiah fourteen twelve, Talking about the Son of the morning. Talking about the devil. And watch that NIV call it, the, call it Jesus Christ. You're crazy if you would believe a book like that. We're wrong to believe a book that takes the blood out and the virgin birth and, and the deity of Christ and the trinity out of 1 John 5, 7. We got a book here that never changes. Thank God we got a book that never changes. Same book that's being preached tonight I got saved is the same book that's being preached. Listen, we ain't all... I don't always understand it all. I don't always live by it all. I broke its laws. I broke its commandments. But I'll tell you one thing. I believe every word in here. I stand on every word in here. And there ain't a verse in this Bible that I disagree with or I'm afraid to preach to you about. Not a verse. Not a verse. Not a verse. The Bible never changes. Let me hurry. Here's some good news for you. Turn to Revelation chapter 22. Heaven never changes. Boy, there's some old grandmas laying in hospitals this morning in rest homes. I'm going to tell you about some things tonight if i got any throat left. My throat's out of shape. Revelation 22.5 Listen to this, folks. This is where we're going to be living pretty soon. This is going to be a with. This is temporal. This is temporal. You say, oh, Lord, I'm just sick and tired of this life. Huh? Just, just hang tight. It ain't going to be long. It ain't going to be long. This is where we're going to live. Revelation 22, 5. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle. Neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Heaven will never change. Was up here at prayer meeting last night? I walked back through the hall, get a drink of water. I seen JD's picture over on the wall. I said, I wish JD could be here in the morning. I said, what do you want me to do, J.D.? Seemed like I heard J.D. say, Preach, Danny! What do you think I want you to do? 
I got to think about the other Mama C, my, my dad, and all of them. Don't ever feel sorry for somebody that dies or saved. Don't ever shed tears and say, oh, how pitiful. Listen, they got it made, man. They got it made. They're living in a perfect environment. Just like Adam and Eve had it to start with, they got it back again forever. And nothing can ever take it away from them. There'll be no locks on our mansion doors. It's wrong. That's why the Bible said not to get... In. By the way, may I say this? Sometimes that's why God allows problems to come in our life to shake us up and make us realize that all we got really is what we got waiting on us over here. There ain't nothing down here worth holding on to. There's nothing down here worth... Listen, there ain't no sin in this world worth making your life miserable for and missing heaven for. Heaven never changes. We'll see mom and dad and family and friends. But as I close this morning, I'll show you one more thing and I'll be finished. Revelation 14. Revelation... I've ever read this verse. It scares me. And I know I'm saved, but this verse scares me. Revelation 14.11 Revelation 14.11 And the smoke of their torment will send us up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night. Let's read that again. This is hell never changes. And the smoke of the torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Somebody quoted somebody in hell saying this. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, listen, hell never changes. It's going to be the same hot one million years from now as it is now. Same temperature. If you're here this morning, you're not right with God. Maybe, maybe you thought you were saved once before. Maybe you don't know if you're saved or whatever. Anyway, if you don't know for a fact, you're on your way to heaven. There's a lot more important things here this morning. New Man of Baptist Church and Danny Castle, who said this and who said that. It's your soul going to heaven or hell. It's your soul going to heaven or hell. Here's what somebody said. The smoke is thick. I've been gagging. The heat is worse than awful. I can hear flames cracking and popping, but I can't see any fire. I feel like I'm burning all over and all through me. The pain is terrible. I squirm and twist, but I can never find a position that helps. I get no rest because of that horrible screams and groans and prayers and curses and screaming. Just now, someone screamed close by and I jumped. Oh, how I pray. I pray out loud. I yell for God to help me, but I have this eerie feeling that it would do no good. I've lost all count of time. I never see the sun and the moon. I'm afraid I'll be kept forever in this madhouse. And every minute seems like an eternity. Where am I? There's no need to run. I don't know where to go. I have a sinking a st- feeling into my stomach that I'm falling all the time. Yet I never land. My price comes crashing into my consciousness. I didn't think about things being wrong when I did them. But now they flash across my memory. How terrible I've been. How I wish I'd have listened to the preacher. How I wish I'd have went to the altar. How I wish I'd have got saved. Hell never changes. You'll know you are hell. Set to go to the lake of fire. And you'll be there forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And it never changes. It never changes. There's some things this morning that you can see anything in this world. You look at these walls. These people will change. We've got to accept that and we've got to live with it. I don't show it cannot go back and undo anything. But there's some things that don't change. And you better accept those things and get them settled in your heart right now. Is it heaven or hell? For you, right here, now, this morning, heaven or hell? Let's stand with our heads bowed.
Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one's moving, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Please, no one moving the instruments are going to be played softly. I'm going to ask you a question this morning, and this question deals with your eternal soul and your eternal destiny. Will it be heaven or will it be hell? Will it be heaven or will it be hell? Maybe there's some of you here this morning and say, Preacher, I've lost a loved one. A tragedy has come in my life. Change has taken place. And I'm having a hard time accepting it. I want you to pray for me this morning. Or maybe you need to just slip out of your seat and come down here to this altar. If you're here this morning and you've never been saved by the grace of God. If you're here this morning and you have been saved but you've not been living like you should live. You need to make some changes. Get some things right. We've already had several people I'm sure saved this morning in junior church or different places. And now it's your time to come. Maybe there's just somebody here. You say, I just don't like my wife. I don't like my wife. I don't like my husband. I don't like this. I don't like that. I'm sick of this world. Well, I take come down here this morning and give it to God. And say, Lord, I'm going to have to accept change. And one day I'm going to a place where we'll never have to change again. Dear God, do what ought to be done in our hearts this morning. Only the Holy Spirit can do His work right now. I've done the best I could do. I tried this morning, Lord. I pray that the power of God would touch every young man, every young lady, every boy, every girl, every person in this room who's not sure of their individual salvation. I pray the power of God will come upon them right now, show them their need of a Savior, and let them come to Jesus. Thank you for these who have already come and are coming. Speak to us right now in Jesus' name. Amen.